Okay, so molds, mycotoxins, autoimmunity, and mast cell activation. And there's ties between all of these shared common areas. This is what I do. This is not so important, but it tells you that uh, uh, what I am. And this is these presentations, webinars, tea times, etc., are to educate. It's I'm not trying to make money. I'm not selling anything. I don't have anything to sell. So how to key, how to solve problems caused by toxins, not by infectious disease agents. Okay, such as um, uh, in micro, found in microbiology. Uh, these are not pathogens. Toxins, detect the cause, remove the cause, repair the dam damage, and the patient is well. So what's happened? Why are we dealing with this issue of molds and mycotoxins so much? Well, one, it's climate change. Here's more hurricanes, floods, rising waters. We read about it every day and see it in the news and on our smartphones. Disasters, damage and health hazards, mold infested homes, schools, businesses, and public buildings. So, however, this is 1993, 30 years ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine, it is estimated that any one time 10 to 25 million workers in 800,000 to 1.2 million commercial buildings in the U.S. will have symptoms typical of SBS, sick building syndrome. And indoor mold spores, well, let me, let me, let me go back here. So you can, 30 years ago, this is what they were saying. So now we know that indoor mold spores, okay, molds are like a plant. Plants make seeds, molds make spores, and these spores are float around, are, are disturbed by walking through a room, opening, shutting a window, opening, shutting a door, etc. And they, these cause persistent changes in inflammatory and immune responses, how the body responds to this. And then if you're chronically exposed, that, in, that induces chronic inflammation. Okay? So here is spores of toxigenic con, uh, fungi contain mycotoxins. They go together like a key on a keychain. Okay? And mycotoxins associated with spores are likely to be absorbed via the respiratory epithelium and translocated to other sites, producing systemic effects. This was published 35 years ago, approximately. So it's not new. Now, um, uh, uh, here is um, this part. Inflammation is in the center. Why? Because all these... Uh, blue circles tell you what that, that inflammation can cause. So molds produce toxin known as mycotoxins. Molds are always present in homes or workplaces or buildings indoors where there's water damage, and they're always producing mycotoxins. Mycotoxin exposure is far more common than expected. In the United States, 85% of buildings have had past water damage, while 43% have current water damage. So two important points. One, a mold that produces mycotoxins, that mold is going to produce a series of mycotoxins, not just one. So it's not one mold makes a mycotoxin. No, it's one mold makes several mycotoxins. And if a mold known to produce mycotoxins is present in a home or building, guess what? The mycotoxins it produces are there as well. Size matters. Here is 100 microns. Mold spores, 2 to 4 microns. Mycotoxins are 0 0.1 microns, the same size as a COVID virus. By the way, have you ever heard of testing for COVID through urine? No, of course not. 
but you have heard about testing for mycotoxins in urine, same size. Exposure to mycotoxins is mainly by inhalation and dermal absorption. Ingestion is negligible, and we'll get into that. So um, trichothecene mycotoxins exhibit potent toxicity in man. The numerous target organ systems include the brain, and that's the principal one. That's the first one mycotoxins go for. The immune system, the heart, lungs, intestines, liver, kidney, and skin. By the way, in all these, um, uh, I'm going to, there's a list of, um, at the end, eight pages of references. Uh, I've put some references directly on the, on the slide where, where um, it permits because of size. But they're all also found at the very end, eight pages. Uh, so it's a long list of, of references. Mycotoxins, what do they do? They're, they, they're, they're very potent protein synthesis inhibitors. They inhibit the synthesis of RNA and DNA. And um, uh, I have a question here. If I have cladosporum in my IgE lab, does it mean water damage where I'm living or in the past? There's always that question that comes up. Is this present or the past? An antibody test to mycotoxins indicate what is going on in your body currently, not something that happened a long ago. And we'll get into that. So it uh, forms DNA, mycotoxins form DNA addicts and protein addicts, and they cause a lot of oxidative stress. And then they cause mitochondrial directed apoptosis. What they actually do is as they get in the cell inside the mitochondria, they cause mitochondrial dysregulation and the cell dies. Mycotoxin antibodies also can bind to human tissue and trigger autoimmune disorders. And we're going to see that. Okay. So this is the food thing. Uh, okay. That, oh, it's, uh, you know, food and food and food. Well, guess what, folks? Low levels of mycotoxins are found in a lot of different foods, cereals, beans. And remember, coffee is a bean, uh, is made from beans, uh, fruits, grape juice, beer, et cetera. Um, and this is by all the big organizations. And for that reason, we can always find some in the urine in parts per billion in healthy people. So the amount of mycotoxin tested in foods have been shown in numerous studies to be below tolerable daily intake set by the FDA, the EFSA, which is the European FDA, and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Health Organization Joint Expert Committee on Food Additives. So this is a recent study by Fry and his, Dr. Fry and his group. They showed that there's one to four mycotoxins in both pasteurized and unpasteurized milk from cows. 91% of all the milk tested had at least one mycotoxin and 30% had two or two to four mycotoxins. However, these were all below tolerable daily intake and easily excreted in urine as are most mycotoxins found in beverages and foods. Here's the citation at the bottom. And here is deoxynivalenol made by Fusarium exposure in Norway and they check different age groups, et cetera. The important part is down here at the bottom so if you're a 170-pound male, you'd have to consume about 14 pounds of ready-to-eat oatmeal or 20 slices of bread that has mycotoxins and mold, okay? So that's just to give you an idea. And um, uh, in the middle of the top part, a two-year-old child weighing 28 pounds would have to consume about 38 ounces of ready-to-eat oatmeal or three and a half slices of bread to be affected in the gut. Um, and, and just to let you, well, I'll get into that a little later. 
Um, now I'll, I'll tell you now, we, Dr. Lenny Weinstock and I published an article last year on molds, mycotoxins, the brain, the gut, and misconceptions. And we looked at the gut and all the information is in that article and I'll be happy to send it to anybody. All you got to do is email me and I give my email at the end. So albumin binds ochratoxin with unusual high affinity, 99.8% of ochratoxin is albumin mount, bound. And is so the ochratoxin is reabsorbed from practically any part of the nephron by both active and transport and passive diffusion. And because of that, the elimination in by glomerular filtration is negligible, but I am told, and I've been told by many, many practitioners that when the urine test is always ochratoxin. Well, read this article. It goes through the molecular interactions, mechanisms of toxicity, and prevention at molecular levels for ochratoxin. Okay. So, well, let's go into the immune system and autoimmunity. Our immune system has a very complex task. Actually, two things. Recognize and ignore all the cells and tissues in our body that belong to us. Attack any and all things foreign to our body. Bacteria, viruses, toxins, anything that's foreign. Our immune system can successfully protect us while recognizing and eliminating billions of microorganisms, toxins, chemicals we come into contact with. So autoimmunity is when this immune system goes awry and starts to attack and destroy tissues, organs, glands, hormones, and enzymes in a person's body. And here it is, it's an epidemic now because the frequency of autoimmunity in the United States over the last three decades has been rising at the an astounding 8.8 .8 average annual increase. And then in a recent review, researchers summarized that taken together, the number of people suffering from autoimmune diseases is 24 to 50 million Americans, 16% of the population. To put it in perspective, autoimmune disease prevalent, prevalence equals heart disease and cancer combined. This was authored by Dr. Stephanie Seneff, a, 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 a friend and wonderful, uh, brilliant lady up at uh, MIT. So um, here she also wrote that causation, that was a subject by Dr. Noel Rose, director of Johns Hopkins Autoimmune Disease Research. He was addressing this when he said, there has to be some kind of environmental exposure because genetics, which accounts for about a third of all cases, don't change that fast. Environmental triggers will be the next wave of research. And that is right. So um, having said that, Let's go to this. Mycotoxins trigger the onset or exacerbation of chronic inflammatory diseases and autoimmune disorders. This was published a couple of years ago. And again, you can read it. Um, there's over 100 recognized autoimmune diseases. These include inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and have a high comorbidity weight, anxiety, depression, and pain, which can serve to induce fatigue. 98% of individuals with autoimmune disease reported that they suffer from fatigue. And in this study, and um, if you read the, the authors, the third author is Dr. Noel Rose, okay, this is in Frontiers and in the journal Frontiers in Immunology, published four years ago. Two thirds of respondents reported their fatigue was profound, debilitating, and prevented them from completing simple everyday tasks. That's awful. I wrote this. I published this. Was published um, 
back a few years ago and and um and i think it was in 2014 if i'm not correct anyway maybe eight, nine years ago yes uh 2014 so um autoimmunity and the gut and it was a review article over 120 references so mycotoxins are related to other chronic illnesses and autoimmunity in particular for examples they mycotoxins in particular may alter the functions of not only the brain and peripheral nervous system, but also the glands of internal secretion, especially the thyroid. And I'm going to show you studies on that. And mycotoxin can cause the development of autoimmune thyroid disease, Hashimoto's, as well as type 1 diabetes. That's another autoimmune disease. This was published uh, three years ago. And this, they... Um, what are linked to, to mycotoxins? POTS, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, and the antibodies to mycotoxins. So there you have it. And here's um, these two studies that get into the POTS issue and the myalgic encephalitis chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay. So the brain and mycotoxins in autoimmune diseases, inflammatory processes, for example, neuroinflammation and multiple sclerosis are key mechanisms to pathophysiology. Environmental agents like food additives and pollutants or toxins, among which are mycotoxins, at prolonged low dose exposure conditions might trigger the essential molecules associated with central nervous system, immune system interaction. This is, again, from a couple of years ago. And um, the same study showed about MS, path pathophysiology, the mycotoxin gliotoxin has been shown to affect and damage my microglia, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. And if you remember, Oligodendrocytes are the cells that produce myelin. And we know that MS is a demyelinating disorder. Okay, so it's a neurotoxins do not use glutathione in anyone that has gliotoxin because it increases the cytotoxicity of, glio, of, of uh, gliotoxin. So don't use glutathione or NAC. And I give you the publication. Here's another one. A study demonstrated that mycotoxin gliotoxin causes demyelination leading to MS. And Rutgers Medical School published this study in 2010, 13 years ago, that stated, we propose here that fungal toxins are the underlying cause of multiple sclerosis and thus may offer an avenue towards an effective cure. So folks, gliotoxin is the major and most potent mycotoxin that is secreted by Aspergillus fumigatus, that's a mold well known, which is capable of injury and killing microglial cells, astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. This is another study showing again, Studies with patients with MS, which is an autoimmune disease of the central nervous system, suggest that fungal infections are among the possible initiators or aggravators of this pathology. So, and I can tell you that I've treated many, many patients over the last 30 some odd years with MS. You treat them for the mycotoxins, their MS clears up. And it is astounding to look at the MRI of the brain and you see all the white spots and then you repeat the MRI six to eight months later and they're gone. In one study, 91 out of 119, 83% of patients presented with peripheral neuropathy, numbness, tingling, tremors, muscle weakness. And they were autoantibodies against myelin basic protein, myelin associated glycoprotein, et cetera, all these. 
and all the patients, okay? So what the same group demonstrated that mycotoxin had mycotoxins had been implicated in the production of ANA and antimyelin antibodies against the nervous system and autoantibodies against smooth muscle, anti-smooth muscle. The most prevalent symptom was fatigue. The actual study is one that um, I was involved with. So, um, and of course, there's older and newer studies. Millions of people um, struggle with this. Um, oops, sorry. And uh, they struggle with Hashimoto's, okay? They eat normal amounts of food, exercise regularly, and they keep, yet they keep gaining weight. Their thyroid levels are difficult to treat. In other words, to get the right balance between T3, T4, TSH. And this is because the cause are mycotoxins, not the thyroid. Once the treatment for mycotoxins is complete, the Hashimoto's goes away. And it was, this is from a journal from three years ago. So, um, and here's another one. Patients with a history of mycotoxin exposure experiencing chronic fatigue, cognitive disorder, and different kinds of hypothyroid symptoms despite treatment with levothyroxine monotherapy. So the patients presented with normal function of thyroid or with required treatment with D4, with normal thyroid stimulating TSH, free T4, and free T3 values, but still with symptoms. Once the treatment for mycotoxin was complete, normal thyroid function returned. Again, folks, you remember what I said in the beginning. Identify the cause, remove the cause, repair the damage. Here's another one. Mycotoxins in autistic toddlers eventually caused autoimmune disease, including lupus. Okay, and here's these two mycotoxins, deoxynivalenol, ochratoxin. And by the way, deoxynivalenol uh, is what it's called here in the United States. In Europe, it's called vomitoxin uh, and some other countries as well. Increased the susceptibility of to develop rheumatoid arthritis. They increased the clinical severity of rheumatoid arthritis they elevated the levels of IL-1 beta and interleukin-6, and these were found in inflamed joints. So let's look at an actual case. This is psoriasis, and look at the finger, the ring finger of his hand holding, where he's holding his shirt up. You see how inflamed that is? That is psoriatic arthritis. Here's another... He's showing his chest and abdomen and look at the finger. Okay. This is two, three months after treatment. He's obviously improving. This is six months later. He was treated for the mycotoxins. Here's a lady. This is the mother of a, of a doctor that speaks at a lot of conferences. And he asked me if I could help his mom. And I did. This was her test. See, just look at it from a, a point of view of how much red it has. Okay. And then she, she, she moved away uh, because her the house was moldy. Here's her before and after picture. Can you tell the difference? Of course. And here is, can you see all the red? There's only one gone. She needed a couple more months before that was also gone. Now I want to help you understand antibodies to pathogens versus antibodies to toxins. <clears throat> there are four categories of pathogens, bacteria, viruses, pathogenic fungi, and parasites. And we develop antibodies to these after an infection exposure slash exposure, okay? And all these are living organisms. They have cell walls, etc., And antibodies to these mean past exposure. So I personally, as a child, had um, 
I, uh, I got the um, uh, a, a chicken pox. And um, the chicken pox, I now probably have antibodies to chicken pox, varicella. But toxins are not alive. They don't have cell walls. They're just molecules. Mercury is a molecule. Glyphosate is a molecule. Arsenic is a molecule. Formaldehyde is a molecule. Mycotoxins are molecules. So antibodies to toxins indicate current immune reaction and not exposure sometime in the past. And once the toxins are gone from the body, as I showed you, the antibody reaction fades away. This is why I always test six months after treatment to see how far down it's gone. And you saw the evidence. I showed you the pictures of the test reports. Here's a mistake I see a, a lot of times. Healthcare practitioners who treat the lab results and not the patient, especially Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia. They do the test result. For example, did you know that 5 to 20% of the general population will test positive for Lyme? How about that? These healthcare practitioners will treat them. And they're, they measure if the if, if it's cured by looking at the lab test, not the patient. That is a mistake, a clinical error. So what is the most precise and accurate test for mycotoxins? It's both IgG indicating a toxic reaction and IgE indicating a mast cell activation for 12 different mycotoxins. So the test report is 24, a panel of 24 12 IgG and 12 IgE, 12 different mycotoxins. And it's my myco lab. That, that, that's the lab I use for my patients and I've used this the last 25 years. So here's a study that came out last year looking at urine testing for mycotoxins. And they looked at serum testing. And you can see it down at the bottom. It was published in October last year. The variability of mycotoxins concentration in urine and its volume based on daily intake <clears throat> demands urine sampling at different times during the day and the normalization of results with creatinine concentration. However, the inter-individual comparison of mycotoxins is challenging because various factors such as gender, age, diet, and muscle mass can influence creatinine secretion. So what they're saying, it's not an accurate test, even if you do it several times during the day, because once a day is nothing. Then here you go, what else do they say? The ELISA method, which is the method used by my microlab to detect mycotoxins in human serum comes with significant accuracy, precision, and specificity. So treatment for all that we've discussed to this point, the first rule of toxicology, get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. And second, simultaneously build back up the immune system while giving an antifungal. Well, let's look at that. And again, person's health cannot be restored if they continue to be exposed to molds and mycotoxins in an indoor environment, no matter what the treatment. So if the treatment doesn't work, they're still being exposed. And there's a huge problem because how do you find out where the mold is? Well, I did a really great um, webinar with, uh, I did, the, web, the webinar was good, but the great person was um, this young man, Brantley May, who knows how to test. And he gave all the pros and cons of each different type of test what you should ask when they're coming to test, et cetera. It's on the My Micro Lab YouTube channel. And you can see it shows two faces, my face and his face. I recommend that's the best way to figure out where the mold is in an indoor environment.
You also want to minimize environmental exposure, pesticides, volatile organic compounds, processed food, you know, artificial sweeteners, artificial food flavorings, colorings, preservative, et cetera. And EMF exposure. A lot of people with mycotoxins are very sensitive to EMF exposure. And there's an article about that. 80% uh, of the immune system is in the gut. So this is where you begin. The main components will be diet, supplements, and probiotics for the gut. Okay? Um, so um, let me go back here for a second. For probiotic, use spore-forming bacilli. Dr. Simon Cutting at Reading University in London did tested all these commercial um, probiotics, most of which, almost all of them, of, of which are lactobacilli and, and bifidobacterium. He found that more than 90% of those two die in the stomach from acidity. He called it dead bacteria therapy. Okay, so use spore forming bacilli for probiotics. I use um, one from Microbiome Labs called Megasporbiotic. Diet, you got to try gluten free for 90 days, avoid dairy, sugar, and soy. I usually tell my patients, don't do it for 90 days, do it for the whole treatment. Gluten's just very inflammatory for the gut. I give Atrocrazol, 100 milligrams BID. I always give it with a little, I recommend it with a little bit of food for better absorption. If the patient starts to have um, uh, digestive issues, either acidity, reflux, uh, queasiness, et cetera, switch from Atrocrazol to brand name Spornox. Why? Where are all generics made? They're made in India or China. Enough said. Um, I get the majority of these from two suppliers. Um, uh, one is Claire Labs, the other, uh, the magnesium from Jigsaw Health, because it's a long acting one. Anyway, and there's studies on this double blind, placebo controlled, randomized studies on all of these. So it's not, I don't, I don't use Dr. Google like a lot of people. Now, here's from a study, and itraconazole, also known as Spornox, is a common antifungal agent that was developed in the 80s. Been in clinical use for 35 years with an established safety record. This was published in 2017, so it's now 41 years. All right, so here's another one. This was published back in 2000 well tolerated with doses of up to 400 milligrams per day being generally free of serious adverse events now if you go to dr google your eyeballs are going to fall out your teeth are going to fall out your liver is going to die uh, and be i don't know what your bones are going to shrivel up and all kinds of things from itraconazole don't believe dr google believe the peer-reviewed medical literature the evidence in medical science. Okay, now, fluconazole. A lot of people make the mistake of using fluconazole. Let's look at that. Candida is a yeast. Yeasts are single cell molds. All the others are multicellular. So aspergillus, penicillium, stachybotrys are multicellular molds. The only ones that are single cell are yeasts, and one of them is candida. This is a classical opportunistic pathogen that resides harmlessly in approximately 50% of individuals and kept in check by the immune system. Fluconazole hits candida. It has no activity against multicellular molds. So here you see, if you use fluconazole, you're just gonna hit one. If you use atraconazole, you're gonna get them all. Wouldn't that be better? Of course. So, oh, and by the way, nystatin is very weak. So don't even bother there. <clears throat> Are you taking, giving a lot of supplements? My gosh, I see, I mean, um, 
patients come to me and they, they're on 25 supplements, 15 supplements, 30 supplements. Here's what a study showed. 11% of nearly 60 tested dietary supplements actually contain the accurate amount of the key ingredients. 40% did not contain a detectable amount of the ingredients at all. 40%. And this is why it's vitally important to do your homework before selecting supplements, as I have done for the last 35 years. Don't believe what you see in Dr. Google. Re remember Abraham Lincoln, what he said. Abraham Lincoln said, don't believe everything you read, read on the internet. Okay, let's switch topics now over to mast cells because this is an important part as well. And one of the questions here, how does itacrazole work on mycotoxins if they don't have cell walls? If you had listened in the beginning, I explained that mycotoxins are attached to mold spores like a key on a keychain. You get rid of one, you get rid of the other. So, Let's go to mast cells. Mast cells are present in most tissues, characteristically surrounding blood vessels and nerves. They're especially prominent near boundaries between the outside world and the internal environment, like skin, mucosa, the lungs and digestive tract, uh, as well as the mouth, the white of your eyes, and nasal passages, okay? And all of these are from studies, by the way. And you can find these studies at the end, eight pages of all the various references. Mast cells naturally occur in the human brain. They interact with the neuroimmune system. In the brain, mast cells are located in a number of structures that mediate the visceral sensory, in other words, pain or neuroendocrine functions. This is including the pituitary stalk, the pineal gland, thalamus, hypothalamus, choroid plexus, and the dural layer of the meninges. So mast cells activated by fungi and their mycotoxin causes, causes irritation of the respiratory tract, the eyes, recurrent sinusitis, bronchitis, cough, neurological manifestations, including fatigue, brain fog, and headaches. And if this continues, it can then lead to mast cell activation syndrome. So mast cells, when activated by certain stimuli, such as IgE antibodies to mycotoxin, release several cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-6, IL-17, tumor necrosis factor, et cetera. And we're going to go into IL-6 here, interleukin-6, in just a moment. Extensive antibiotic use, as in limes, can trigger MCAS, okay? And bring about, of course, intestinal permeability. You've destroyed the microbiome. That's where your gut is where 80% of your immune system is. And by taking all these antibiotics for months and years, you destroy it, okay? GI motility problems, et cetera. So M MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome, symptoms may include rashes, hives, fletching, itching, with or without rashes, bloating, reflux, nausea. And I find nausea one of the most commonest complaints for MCAS patients. Diarrhea, low blood pressure, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, headaches, brain fog, anxiety, fatigue, weight loss, weakness, dizziness, and others. We're going to look at a study and just say, what is IL-6, interleukin-6? It's a multifunctional cytokine that regulates immune response. <clears throat> it regulates inflammation, homeopoiesis, and the acute response as well. It has an important role in the development of autoimmune diseases. You see where we're getting tied to the autoimmune diseases that we discussed before and now MCAS? What commonality is there between the two mycotoxins? And interleukin-6 is released by mast cells when stimulated by IgE mycotoxins 
a microtoxin antibodies. Well, which microtoxin caused the release of IL-6? Nine of them. The panel of my My Micro Lab contains 12, but these nine are the ones that cause the release of um, interleukin-6, IL-6. Here is uh, ochratoxin, significantly increases IL-6. Uh, suppresses n synth, increases the susceptibility to rheumatoid arthritis, causes inflammation in the nasal mucosa. Alternaria toxin, increased secretion of IL-6, dam induces damage to DNA. When you damage DNA, that can trigger cancer and microtoxins are known carcinogens. And we're going to see that just at the very end. T2 toxin significantly elevated the levels of IL-6 in serum and increased TNF-alpha. Satrotoxin increases and potentiates the pro-inflammatory cytokine production of IL-6, magnifies the innate inflammatory response in people. Deoxynivalenol, it's also known as DON. No reference to the previous president or anything like that. Ha ha. Okay, vomitoxin. Significantly increased IL-6 production affects bronchial cells directly, okay? And mastocytosis study published two years ago on 139 patients, 78 females and 61 males. 71% had skin issues, GI problems in one half, cardiovascular issues in 36%, musculoskeletal in 27, fatigue in a fourth, and sexual impairment in a fourth of these patients. So um, what were the symptoms noted in this study? Flushing, itching, low blood pressure, gastro gastrointestinal complaints, irritability, headaches, sexual impairment, concentration problems they couldn't they had to read the same paragraph two three times okay memory loss neuropsychiatric problems and here's autism and mast cell activation a study showed that in autism spectrum disorder there's a tenfold increase in children with mastocytosis as compared to the general population and one third of patients with mastocytosis complain of neuropsychological symptoms such as fatigue, cognitive impairment, and depression. So here's an actual person, and you're going to see photographs and the tests. A 28 year old female with visible mold in the home. Uh, she was very active in sports, social life, all kinds of things <coughs> until these. Um, lesions started up on her skin and she stays at home now of course she went to dermatologists first she saw and then she saw clinicians they gave her binders uh, or corticosteroids after one month and no changes she quit she first quit the binders and then she quit the steroids because she couldn't sleep because of the side effects which is pretty common in, with steroids so what were her main symptoms? Fatigue, nausea, gastrointestinal complaints, pain, itching, and flushing. What do these look like? You see here on the on the forearm and here on her uh, upper upper legs. And here was her test. Look at the IgE, which is on the right. See all the red on the right? Okay. Before, after. And here's her wrist. She did this to show me her wrist. She sent this picture to me. Okay. And here's after. Look at the right. The IgG, IgE antibodies are all down to nothing six months later. Here's another gal. You know, and she, she wrote this. I look like an addict or something. This is a few weeks before, after being treated for Lyme and before I knew I had mold issues. Okay. And this is a year later. She's taken her three little girls by herself for a day at the beach. Okay. Look at her before and after. 
Okay. And you can see the dates. It's about three months. Okay. So binders, let's hit binders. Animal studies in pigs, rabbits, sheep, broiler chickens, ducks, turkeys, rats, and mouse, mice. Binders help. And this is only in, under laboratory, very strict laboratory conditions, okay? Very precise laboratory conditions. But there are no medical or scientific published studies to support their use in humans for anything to do with molds or mycotoxins. What is the dose? What is the frequency? Are, is, are there any drug interactions? Are there any adverse reactions? No one knows because there's nothing published for humans and molds for these binders. There is this one study that was published four years ago and stated very plainly, binders rely on the absorption of mycotoxins from the gut, preventing it from getting into the bloodstream. Okay, well, which ones? Kaolinite, clays, activated charcoal, zeolite, bentonite, et cetera. They're effective in neutralizing one mycotoxin, aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is not found indoors. They are ineffective in all other mycotoxins. In addition, they also bind vital vitamins as well as macro and micro elements. Enough said. These are tests that don't really help or they're sham. Marcons is a sham. It, there's no such thing in medicine, okay? Neuroquant is uh, mainly a test for brain atrophy. So it's good for like Alzheimer or brain trauma, you know, TBI, traumatic brain injury. The SPECT scan, single photon emission computerized tomography, is much more useful in clinical medicine. I've known Dr. Daniel Amen for, gosh, 30 years. And he was instrumental in getting the knowledge out on spec scans. I highly recommend it. I use it on my patients. Uh, the HLA-DR and mycotoxins and this, you know, um, genetic testing, and they say it affects 25% of the population. Well, 25% of 330 million Americans, that are, that's the U.S. population, is 82 million Americans who are supposed to be affected by this gene, and there's no published studies relating this to molds or mycotoxins. There's no research. It's not taught anywhere. It has no basis in medical science. But let me show you something else, another disease that affects 34. Okay, this one back here, 82. This one, 34 million with almost 50 million less. It's diabetes. Everybody knows. Everybody's heard it. Etc. Yet this HLA-DR that's supposed to affect all 82 million people is not studied anywhere. There's nothing in medicine and science linking it to molds or mycotoxins. What about the OAT test? Okay. Well, it's supposed to measure and tell you if you about molds. Okay, that are produced by in the body as part of a something. It's used to check. It, rare inborn genetic defects of metabolism, most often in newborns. It is a useless test for molds. There's no evidence in the entire medical literature, over 100 million published articles in PubMed, uh, in the National Library of Medicine, that has anything to do with organic acids. I remember doing my rotation through um, uh, neonatology and having to read about it but I never saw it. Now, here's something that is new. This is fungi found in 35 different cancers. This was published last year. 17,401 patients, okay? Tissue blood serum samples from 35 cancer types. Fungi were found <clears throat> in individual tumor types and contribute to carcinogenesis on these. Esophageal, pancreatic, breast, lung, melanoma, ovary, colon, brain, and bone cancers, okay? Now, here's the good part, okay? I showed you this previously. 
he told you it was now 41 years because this was published in 2017. Well, actually, they're using it now for cancer treatment. So, folks, with all this, um, if you, this is the study I mentioned to you with Dr. Lenny Weinstock, an excellent physician in, uh, in <clears throat> St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we published this study, and we mention again a lot. It it has a, 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 quite a number of of um, uh, references, and I can tell you by looking at ResearchGate. If you look it up in ResearchGate, it's it's had thousands of reads. So, uh, and and just to let you know, here's all the references: eight pages of of a list of references. So now I have some questions to answer. Let me see here. Okay. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Gale, for putting on the chat the um, the YouTube presentation with Grantley May about how to do testing. Thank you very, very much. Um, how does atacanazole wall, if they don't have cell walls, I already explained that. How long should be a course? Um, uh, the medical textbooks say 12 to 18 months. If you use the supplements and the diet, et cetera, and I have a, a diet specifically for mold, micro, mold slash mycotoxins, it reduces it down to about six months. Okay. <clears throat> And can mycotoxins be the cause of early cataract or floaters? <clears throat> I don't know the I do not have the answer to that. I know they cause corneal damage, damage of the cornea. Um, can mycotoxin destroy connective tissue, cause hypermobile? Yes. Well, that's Ehlers Danlos syndrome, actually, is what it can cause. Can people herx on itraconazole feel temporarily worse? About 5% of my patients, and I've seen over 16,000, um, 5% have a herx, lasts a few days. I just tell them to tough it out and continue taking it. Um, and can mycotoxins cause adult onset cutaneous mastocytosis? Well, you saw the pictures. Are there papers that say mold is one of the leading causes of MCS? Well, I I just showed you several citations, and you have eight pages of of references to look through. So, um, uh, when and here's a, a a comment. When I was mold toxic, I had numerous floaters. Once on the itraconazole and other supplements for treatment, the floaters went away at about four months of treatment, okay? Can you explain the mechanism of mycotoxins causing hypermobility disorders in the next two, three minutes? <laughs> no. Um, however, um, uh, you, um, if if you, I have, I've published over a hundred studies. I have several chapters in medical textbooks, <clears throat> and you can find the answer to that at, in in a number of, of articles. Okay, uh, here's another one. Once mold remediation is done in a home, can mycotoxins remain? To my knowledge, no. But I am not. A, I, I, I'm not a home doctor. That's a Brantley May question, not me. Can molds cause a histamine release when I get in the shower and cause tachycardia? Well, anything can happen. Yeah, from molds. A lot of things can happen from molds, but especially mycotoxins, okay? So, um, uh, and if you read, uh, for example, the studies that, I and many others have published, they discuss all the symptoms. This, that's one of the most common things. Um, I published a chapter in a medical book with several other authors, and we listed the symptoms from the most common to the least common as, uh, as part of that chapter. 
The chapter is on the immunological and neurological effects of molds and mycotoxins in humans. Um, any other questions, folks? Okay. Remember, you can send me an email and I'll be happy to send you this. I've got several other articles. I wrote another one. Um, um, okay, here, will Achkazal help with high levels of glyphosate? Well, no, glyphosate is not a, is not a mold or a mycotoxin. Glyphosate is Roundup, causes cancer. Uh, where does the mold most commonly reside? They affect mostly the brain. Where were the top three symptoms? Fatigue was the best, biggest one. And then it went on to several others. Do you recommend support bile production while detoxing? This is a, a typical shoemaker, Neil Nathan, um, Dr. Google thing. No. All that bile stuff doesn't exist. All right. Um, okay, folks. And again, base yourself on, on um, real medicine, not opinions, because the internet is full of opinions. They don't give you the facts such as here look okay these eight pages they don't have that okay folks well i wish you all the best um next week on wednesday tea time okay tea time um, and which I'll be letting you ask a bunch of questions. You can ask me about heavy metals, about Lyme. You can ask me about uh, autoimmune diseases, mast cell activation, anything that has to do with medicine. Don't ask me about houses because I don't do that. That's, that's not my expertise. People are my expertise. Um, so, Thank you, folks, for joining. Take care. Have a great week. See you next Wednesday, same place, same time.